Hello and welcome to the second global symposium of the Laszlo Institute of New Paradigm Research. This symposium is on the new paradigm in cosmology. I'm Alexander Laszlo, and I'm the director of research at the Laszlo Institute. I'm speaking to you from Buenos Aires, Argentina, where we're just moving into summer. It's getting quite hot. Um, I'd like to take a moment, though, just to see uh, everyone here. I, I have myself on gallery view, and I'm seeing everyone here. We have 133 people already here. We had almost 1,000 people who have registered for this event. So amazing. This is really a global event that we're engaged in. I'm going to invite everyone, if you would please, maybe just to say hello in the chat. I'll start by saying hola from Buenos Aires, Argentina. You can just say where you're from and uh, we get to see this global community as we're gathering here today to explore the new paradigm in cosmology. We have a wonderful program for you today and tomorrow at the cutting edge of where science meets wisdom traditions and perennial spiritual insights. Um, this is part of what we explore here at the Laszlo Institute, how to make sense of the world around us from the very small, the micro dimensions of the quantum down to the Planck scale and the meso dimensions, the world that we navigate on a day-to-day -day basis here on earth up to the macro dimensions of the world uh, and in the universe and the cosmos beyond. So today and tomorrow, we're going to be mainly focusing on that domain, the whole cosmos, but it will inevitably take us into explorations of the subquantum realms with implications for how we live our life uh, and the story we tell ourselves about who we are and what we are doing here on this third rock from the sun. So, I encourage you to explore a bit about our research program and uh, to think a little bit about ways in which you yourself might be interested in participating and in contributing to research. We'll put a link here in the chat just so you can see if you want to where to get hold of the research program of the Laszlo Institute of New Paradigm Research. So our first symposium, keeping in mind that this is the second symposium that we're engaging in right now, our first symposium took place recently. It was the one immediately preceding this one, and it was on the new paradigm in politics, that meso dimension that I mentioned earlier about human affairs and experiences of life on Earth. Um, through a rich, rich exchange that we had in that symposium, we explored issues of governments and public policy making and uh, organizational development, civil society, law, and the self-organizing participatory uh, community dynamics. It was really a very rich, rich symposium as well. And we explored truly how interdependent and how interconnected we are on this planet, but not just on this planet, but as part of the planet, as part of the way it itself evolves and adapts. We have just finished compiling the first volume that will be uh, part of a three volume series of social science research reports uh, on the symposia. Uh, this one was, the first one was compiled by one of our guest speakers, in fact, uh, Dr. Anna Lou Smitsman and yours truly. Uh, this will be published uh, by Select Books in the coming year. The next symposium after this, the third symposium is already in the works. And that one is going to be on the new paradigm in consciousness. So the first one was on the new paradigm in politics. This one that we're starting today is on the new paradigm in cosmology. And the third one that's coming up already planned for March of this coming year, March 2022, uh, is going to be on new paradigm in consciousness. So stay tuned. This symposium, just a little bit about it, we're going to have here some uh, opening remarks uh, from the president and founder of uh, the Laszlo Institute in just a moment. But let me mention that this symposium today and tomorrow is going to take the insights that we developed uh, a bit in the uh, first symposium about the human scale questions of how we are interconnected and interdependent and cast them onto the broadest canvas, paint the biggest picture in the grand scheme of things. We're going to explore, I would invite you to explore with us, the difference between what it would mean to be living in a universe governed by cold, sterile forces and in a universe that is of a participatory nature. 
the shift in the narrative would really change the way in which we play our role in this narrative ourselves, from being passive victims of the forces of evolution to being its active agents. And that would mean a shift in the thinking, shifting from thinking that change happens to us and understanding that change happens through us. To get to this kind of understanding, we're going to need to have an upshift of our consciousness. But I think you might hear a little bit more about that in just a moment. So before we go on with the rest of the program, I just wanted to take a moment to introduce the team that has been working so hard to put all of this together for you uh, in the next couple of days. Now, there are many more people working at the Laszlo Institute of New Paradigm Research. So this is just the symposium crew. Um, so we're going to be then uh, bringing them up for the stage so you can just see who they are. Uh, they'll be uh, just visible for you for a moment. Uh, we'll start with Richard Bloom. He is the uh, symposium director, and he is really both the chief architect and the orchestra conductor of this whole event, in addition to being one of our guest speakers. Next, we have Dr. Georgi Sabo, who is the executive director of the Laszlo Institute and whose understanding is beautifully matched by her depth and knowledge of new paradigm science and spirituality. Nora Chisar is our director of communications and public relations. And so all the messages that you have been receiving and will likely continue to be receiving have most likely come through her in some way. Thanks, Nora. Fabrizio Beria is our fearless webmaster and our sysop. Uh, coming to you from uh, Italy. Izzy Kring is with us as part of our technical support team. Um, she is subcontracted uh, by the Laszlo Institute with Lyft AV Productions and is helping us do all of our uh, online magic that you see happening right here, right now. And uh, the last one to invite up here is our founder and president, is Professor Urban Laszlo. Truly, all of this revolves around him, his insights, and his groundbreaking work in this area. So without further ado, I pass the talking stick to Urban. Alexander, thank you. You see, we didn't coordinate. We didn't discuss what you're going to say. So you said exactly what I wanted to say. And this is very good. We are on the same line. We are on the same level. And I think I can talk to other people as well. Because I'm not going to talk to, that's not my rule, to, to talk about, to give my views of the cosmology, of a new paradigm in cosmology. This is a platform. This is something that to which the Lazar Institute is opening for you to discuss, to come together. We each express our ideas, but there is a, there is a value once in a while to come together and exchange our ideas and exchange our, our suppositions or even our intuitions. <clears throat> I'm not going to speak about my own except to know this much, that I have a background conviction that this cosmos, the wholeness that the, that the Greeks called cosmos, is not accidental <clears throat> and is not as a layer cake of, cake of separate things. It is connected. That is ultimately all things are connected with all other things. So that what happens at the largest level also influences and actually is happening at the same time at the smallest level. Also what is happening at one point is happening at other points, at all other points. So this concept is a background. This gives a reason, this gives a rationale for holding this symposium. Why do we go as far out literally and, met and metaphorically as the cosmos? because the cosmos is us. We are the cosmos. We together are the cosmos and we are together one. This seems to be poesy, poetry. This seems to be just metaphysics, but I think today it's physics. It's quantum physics, it's quantum biology, it's quantum psychology, and above all, it's, it's quantum new paradigm physics. <clears throat> what happens in the cosmos is highly relevant to us because what happens to the cosmos also happens to us. If the cosmos came into being, and this will be discussed at the symposium, if we have reason to suspect that the cosmos came into being, let actually, in my terminology, I would say the universe came into being, the cosmos may be the background, maybe it's something eternal beyond it all. But if the universe came into being, 
and we are children of the universe, then however, how in whichever way the cosmos, the universe came into being, also is a womb for us, also is a pointer how we came into being. Now, this is extremely important on this day and age. We are now hopefully soon, I'm optimist, pulling out of, the, of a global crisis. And we'll be inquiring ever more as a humanity, as a human species, as to whether we should continue the way we have been. Because the way we have been has generated crisis. I think even the virus crisis has to do with the way we have been. Nothing is accidental in this world. So this is an extremely opportune time, extremely timely to be discussing these issues. Always on the presupposition that yes, it is relevant to us because the identity of the cosmos reflects or, or originates the identity of our individual selves. Our individual self is actually more accurately said reflects the identity, the wholeness, the oneness, and the nature of the cosmos. <clears throat> to know this is to ask, what is the nature of the cosmos? What can we know about it? Einstein said that the most remarkable thing about the universe is that it's so coherent that we can know it. At least we can know some parts of it, some aspects of it. So the cosmos is given to us. We are at a turning point at a tipping point, at a bifurcation point, if you like, in which we can have a larger role in, the, in organizing our future, in deciding our future, because it is a time of chaos, a time of creativity. Chaos is very often the boom of innovation and of the next step. We can make use of this, but we have to ask that in this symposium, we want to contribute to answering this question. Who are we? We are a part of this world. We are a part of this cosmos. So obviously we have to ask, what is the cosmos? I open the symposium for this discussion and leaving it open to all the participants to ask this question, to answer it to the best of their ability. The importance of this question is more than individual. It is more than theoretic. It's important for the species as a whole, for our future as humanity. We have to find a better way forward. We have to have a better understanding of who we are and what our world is. That is the, that is the keynote I'd like to suggest to you. We, have, we will be hearing from outstanding people. <clears throat> we'll be having debate discussions and then we'll be publishing the results. And all this is part of the work of the, of the, new, of the Laszlo Institutes for New Paradigm Research. As Alexander Voss has already said, and as we will continue saying today, uh, this symposium is to be a milestone in bringing in people from all the different parts of the world in a discussion, which is of the greatest relevance today. Not just theoretic relevance, practical relevance. Who are we? Where are we going? How do we know which way to go? Does the cosmos give us any answers? Does the cosmos give us a guide? Let's ask these questions. It's my heart's first thanks go to Richard Bloom, who is the initiator of this symposium and director and the orchestra conductor, as Alexander says, and to all our other collaborators, Georgi Sabo and Alexander himself, of course, and all of the technical team who is behind it all the members and friends of the Laszlo Institute. Having said this much, I wish you good discussions, illuminating discussions, help us understand a little bit what the cosmos is so we could understand finally a little more who we are. I now hand it over to Richard Bloom, our brilliant orchestra conductor. Richard, it is yours now. Come online, it is your show. Thank you, Irvin. And thank you for that very inspiring and insightful introduction. And I'm very excited to be here today and to moderate this new paradigm in cosmology symposium. So I I'd like to thank Urban Laszlo and his team for giving me this opportunity. And it's been wonderful working with his team 
It's been a great pleasure. They're wonderful people. I'm happy to say that we have a wonderful group of speakers also who will be presenting this weekend. They come from all over the world, including Singapore, India, Israel, the Netherlands, England, and the United States. What makes this symposium unique is the fact that its focus is on new paradigm cosmologies. There are several approaches to cosmology in general. There are philosophical approaches, religious and spiritual approaches, and scientific approaches. What I find compelling about the new paradigm cosmologies is that they blend all of these approaches into one. Personally, I've always been fascinated by both science and spirituality. Both approaches reveal wonderful secrets about our universe. And for myself, it's as though there are two parts to my being. There's the objective side fascinated by science, and there's the internal side enchanted with spirituality. For that reason, the blending of science and spirituality is crucial for my own completeness. And that's why I'm focused on creating cosmology, which unites science and spirituality. During the symposium, we're going to hear thoughts about new paradigm cosmologies from three different perspectives. First, we'll hear from cosmologists who are developing new cosmologies. The second approach is a historical one. We'll hear about cosmologies from past societies and their role in shaping culture. And finally, we'll hear about new paradigm cosmology, how new paradigm co cosmologies can lead humanity forward during this time of crisis that Irvin just spoke of and lead us in creating a new world order. Creation myths and cos cosmologies have always played a vital role in cultures because they provide answers to fundamental questions as to, as to why the universe exists, how it came into being and the purpose of life. Every culture has had a cosmology. Today, we live in a highly technical, scientifically advanced, advanced culture. Just the fact that we're all gathered together from all over the world to participate in this symposium through a technology is a testimony to how technologically oriented our culture has become. So it's but natural that the prevalent modern day creation myth is scientifically based. It's the Big Bang Theory coupled with the theory of evolution. On one hand, this cosmology is very powerful because it's based on genuine scientific data. From that perspective, the Big Bang is not a myth, it's a fact. But the scientific cosmology is not totally satisfying. Physics offers no explanation as to why the Big Bang occurred and evolutionary the theory relegates life to simply the result of random mutations. According to these th theories, life and the universe are meaningless and they reinforce materialistic viewpoints. Thus, scientific myths fail providing an essential aspect of what myths have provided cultures for eons, providing humanity with a vision as to why we are here and the purpose of life. This lack of purpose has left a spiritual void. And it's because of this void that new paradigm cosmologies have emerged. What new paradigm cosmologists recognize is that cutting edge scientific theories mirror descriptions of the cosmos as revealed in ancient spiritual, spiritual texts and by modern day spiritual teachers. With this recognition in mind, the new paradigm cosmologists have developed cosmologies, which though based on science, tend to mirror ancient spiritual truths. By uniting science and spirituality, these cosmologists serve as the foundation for an emerging new paradigm a shift in human consciousness upon which a more equitable and sustainable world will form. During this conference, we're gonna hear from several leading new paradigm cosmologists. You'll find that each one approaches the construction of their theories from a unique perspective. For example, some start from existing science and extend it in order to reveal that it's in accord with ancient spiritual texts. Another approach also starts from scientific theory and illustrates how it reveals that the universe is a unified, holographically manifested entity. And another approach hypothesizes that existing science is not complete, as it's unable to explain consciousness. In order to be complete, consciousness and free will must be seen as fundamental aspects of nature. A third approach hypothesizes that in order to make existing science complete, scientific and spiritual cosmologies must be merged together into a single vision, resulting in a new framework that explains the origins of the cosmos and the role of consciousness in its evolution. And yet another approach will present a cosmology based upon the premise that the entire universe exists solely within our own consciousness. I suggest that you, the viewer, 
listen to each one of these speakers and see what resonates with you. And also pay attention to what these different cosmologies have in common and where they diverge. If you have any questions, there will be a question and answer period after each presentation. Submit your questions into the Zoom chat box. We'll be monitoring it and we'll be selecting questions to ask the presenters. We also have a breakout session each day. This will give you each an opportunity to share with a small group of other participants your own views on cosmology and to share what you've gained from watching the various presentations. The very last session of the symposium will be a panel discussion comprised of the various presenters. You will be able to submit questions for that panel discussion. Uh, we'll have a couple of short breaks during each session. And with that, I turn it back to you, Alexander. Thank you so much, Richard. Well, for everybody now, we are actually done with all of what we might think of as the preamble. Uh, we've done the, uh, the welcome address, the opening remarks, and the introduction to the symposium. So now we're going to get into the actual symposium itself with our speakers. And I am uh, taking a, a little bit the moderating role here from Richard, although he is, as the conference, uh, the symposium uh, director, he's going to be moderating the, the lion's share of this event. But because he is the next speaker, he can't also moderate himself. So let me now do the formal introduction for our next speaker, speaker uh, Richard Bloom. A little bit about his background for you. Uh, Richard's research focus on uniting concepts from science and Eastern spirituality into a single vision. His existence framework offers a comprehensive vision spanning from the events which led to the Big Bang to the formation of time and space to how consciousness is generated in the brain and concludes with an explanation as to why it is possible for humans to experience the infinite transcendent reality. His multidisciplinary approach was inspired by his work by his college advisor uh, and Nobel Prize winner Herbert Simon while he was at Carnegie Mellon University. Richard is a follower on, uh, of the spiritual master Mehar Baba, and he has made many visits uh, to his retreat in India, as well as being an active member of the Mehar uh, Center at Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, where Richard currently resides. Now that he's retired from his software development business, he's focusing on development, on developing his com cosmological framework. You can find out more about his books and articles and uh, uh, videos at his website, which is at richardbloom.net. As I mentioned to you, to everyone earlier, uh, Richard is the current director of Symposia. But what we also want to mention is that he's a member of the research board of the Laszlo Institute, and he's in charge of the new paradigm science strand here with us. His uh, presentation today is going to be on the existence framework, unifying scientific and spiritual cosmologies. Richard, over to you. Thank you, Alexander. So today I'm going to present an overview of a cosmology that I've been developing entitled the existence framework. The framework is an attempt to combine scientific and spiritual cosmologies into a single vision, a single framework. And the framework spans the entire evolution of the universe from its creation to human consciousness to spiritual experience. It attempts to answer questions that science has not yet been able to answer, including what caused the Big Bang, how to reconcile general relativity with quantum mechanics, how does consciousness arise in the human brain, and questions regarding spiritual experience, such as if the mystic experience is an illusion, what evolutionary advantage does it offer, and what are the dynamics of spiritual experience, if indeed they are real? The framework starts with a spiritual cosmology, merges it with theories of physics, including the Big Bang theory and general relativity. Then a spiritual psychology is merged with concepts from neuroscience, cognitive psychology, and computer science. Using spiritual revelations regarding the transcendent reality, uh, they are merged with psychology and evolutionary biology. And the result are three theories. There's a theory of quantum gravity, a theory of human consciousness, and a theory regarding spiritual experience. The common theme throughout is something I refer to as existence. Existence is a singular attribute of the transcendent infinite reality, I believe, and it serves as the core of the new theories that I'm creating. 
All these theories are also interconnected. The theory of quantum gravity is used in the theory of consciousness, and the theory of consciousness is used in the theory of spiritual dynamics. Personally, I rely upon the cosmology of a modern day spiritual master who I've been following for many years. I believe he has the most clear expressions of spiritual cosmology that I am familiar with. His cosmology is a reinstatement of ancient truths found in spiritual tra traditions, such as Vedantaism, Sufism, and others, but told from a modern day perspective. Meher Baba describes the transcendent reality, the reality beyond the universe, as being one infinite eternal existence in which absolute oneness prevails. Nothing else exists. Creation of the universe begins with an impulse within the infinite existence to acquire consciousness, knowledge of itself. In order to know itself, it contrasts itself to what it is not. And as there are no other things existing to contrast itself to, the only thing that it can, can contrast itself to is absolute non-existence or nothingness. When the infinite existence contrasts itself to absolute non-existence, the infinite existence immediately acquires consciousness while non-existence remains unconscious. But the nothing, the non-existence takes on a reality of its own imbibing all the attributes of the original infinite existence. And so it also seeks to seek consciousness and replicates the creation process. In doing so, it creates innumerable more non-existence or drops of non-existence. And according to Meher Baba's cosmology, each of these points is a soul, an individual soul, which will go on to evolve its, uh, its own consciousness. Now, starting with this premise of this Meher Baba's spiritual cosmology, I extend it by proposing that each soul has its first manifestation in the universe in the form of what I call existence, or I call existence particle or quantum of existence. So the question is, how do these existence particles manifest in the physical universe? And for that, I'm gonna to turn to physics. And one of the things I find interesting is that Meher Baba's cosmology dovetails with the Big Bang Theory, and particularly the aspect of singularity, which is a part of the Big Bang Theory. Meher Baba states that the entire universe emerges from this transcendent state through what he calls an own point, a finite point of non-existence. What's interesting is that the own point is identical in concept to a singularity. So now what's a singularity? According to Meher Baba's theory, a singularity is, a most, is the most finite point from which the entire universe emerges. At the time of the Big Bang, the entire universe, all the galaxies of the universe, all space and time, everything is shrunken in size to a point smaller than an electron. This is all determined through Einstein's theories of general relativity. And his theories actually indicate that singularities occur in two places, at the beginning of the universe and inside of black holes. At both points, his equations result in what's known as infinite space-time warping. Space-time warping causes gravity, and that's infinite space-time warping would be the most extreme gravity, and that's why black holes or black holes because its gravity is so intense, not, no light can come out. And in case of extreme singularity, everything just reduces to a point of non-existence. In my framework, I propose that the time of the Big Bang, time, space, energy, and matter emerge into existence from a singularity. And at a black hole singularity, space, time, matter, and energy vanish from existence. The notion of space, time, and matter, and energy entering existence, or the entering the universe and vanishing from the universe, it's a radical proposition. I recognize that. It's, it goes against the conservation of matter and energy. However, there's actually a precedent established in physics of virtual particles entering and exiting from existence. And so this notion might not actually be so far-fetched. And I propose that existence is a major component of the universe, just as time, space, energy, and matter are major components. Existence is fundamental. Nothing can exist without existence. We live in a notion of existence, but we don't realize it because we never experience non-existence. We're like fish who don't know what water is because they've never been outside of water. So if existence is a major component of the universe, what are its properties? And how does it interact with other properties of the universe, particularly time and space? 
So to get a handle on that, I turned to general relativity and quantum mechanics, and in particular, the problem of how to reconcile general relativity with quantum mechanics. And I believe that the introduction of another aspect of the universe, existence, can help solve that longstanding problem of reconciling general relativity and quantum mechanics. To do this, I researched how major breakthroughs in physics came about in the past. And that historical perspective uh, and uh, analysis revealed that basic principles common to major breakthroughs, well, there's, I found three major principles. I found the equivalence principle, the hierarchical principle, and the quantum principle. The, let's look at the first principle, the equivalence principle. The, the notion of the, that principle is, and it's, it's found in most of these major breakthroughs, or all of them actually, that when uh, it establishes an equivalence between two previously unrelated phenomenon. For example, Newton established an equivalence between a force acting on objects causing it to fall to the earth and the force causing planets to revolve around the sun. This led to his theory of gravity. Faraday worked with an equivalence between electricity and magnetism. And Maxwell established an equivalence between electromagnet, electricity, magnetism, and light, which led to his equations of electromagnetism. Uh, Einstein had a bunch of equivalences. He established an equivalence between the force acting on accelerating bodies and the gravitational force, which led to his theory of general relativity. He also found an equivalence between matter and energy, as we know through the formula E equals mc squared. And he found an equivalence between space and time, creating the space-time continuum. So now the second principle is a hierarchical principle. It states that entities previously assumed to be elementary are actually comprised of something more elementary. For example, atoms were thought to be elementary until it was discovered that they are comprised of electrons, protons, and neutrons. And protons were thought to be elementary until it was discovered that they are comprised of quarks. And the final principle that I'll use is the quantum principle which states that quantities that were once considered continuous are actually discrete, occurring in quantum packets. And the example is Einstein's photoelectric effect revealed that energy was, that was thought to be continuous actually occurs in quantized packets called photons. And his discovery led to the formation of quantum mechanics. So this problem of bridging general relativity with quantum mechanics has uh, challenged science and physics for over hundred years General relativity is a theory of gravity, and so it deals with space-time, as space-time dynamics determine gravity. Quantum mechanics describes how matter and energy relate through the standard model. So what is thought is a theory of quantum gravity, which would explain the force of gravity in quantum terms, just like all the other forces of energy are explained by quantum mechanics. There have been many attempts. Einstein tried with his unified field theory. There, was string th there is string theory, loop quantum gravity, all these attempts have not really yet succeeded in rectifying general relativity and quantum mechanics. So I believe the introduction of another item into the stratum of the universe, in this case existence, can solve the problem. And the first step is to apply the equivalence principle by establishing an equivalence between space, time, and energy and matter. Now, how might that equivalent come about? Well, I believe the equivalence is found by applying the second principle, the hierarchical principle. I suggest the hierarchical arrangement in which time and space are the actual substance of energy and matter. And the third step is to apply the quantum principle. That is to say that time and space are not continuous, but rather are comprised of discrete items, discrete, and they have a substance. So now the question is, what is the substance of space-time? And I propose that it's existence. Existence is the substance of time. And in fact, in the hierarchical arrangement, Exist, existence is the underlying structure of everything. And furthermore, just as matter and energy are quantized, so too is existence. And I refer to it, that quantum, as an existence particle. Because existence particles are the composition of time and space, they themselves can have no mass, exert no force, consume no space, nor endure for any length of time. Existence particles enter into the universe and then immediately vanish before any time can elapse and they don't take up any space. An existence particle only contains information. It's like a bit in a computer. It's either on or it's off. It either exists or does not exist. An existence particle could also be considered not just a quantum of existence, but it could also be considered a quantum of consciousness or a quantum of information or even a quantum of love. 
all these different descriptions are at this level of the universe are really the same because everything is still merged at this point in the universe. So now where does the existence particles emerge from? Well, I propose that they are the substance which emerges from the infinite transcendent reality when the contrast bef between infinite existence and absolute non-existence non occurs. That is the formation of innumerable existence particles. According to Mayor Baba, it's cosmology, these are souls, but this is the first manifestation in the evolution of the universe of a soul. So now the question is, how does time form from existence? Because we have this hierarchical arrangement, existence forms time, time forms space, space time or fluctuate, fluctuations of space time become matter, matter is condensed energy. I propose that there's a in, an intrinsic desire on the part of existence particles to regain the original state of unity, that it, regain the state of infinite existence. An existence particle bonds with a partner, a just vanished existence particle. And in a bonded pair, one particle plays the role of infinite existence and the other plays the role of non-existence. They mimic or replicate that original creation process. And since an existence particle can only last for a sec, uh, not even a moment, they immediately flip and the non-existent particle comes into existence and the particle that was existing goes into non-existence. And they continue to flip and they flip indefinitely. Each flip becomes between existence and non-existence represents a moment of time, a Planck moment, the smallest, most discrete amount of time that's possible in the universe. Innumerable moments of time are created, but there's yet no flow of time at this stage in the evolution of the universe. There's no past, present, or future yet established. Time strings form from individual moments of time, and time is existence flowing from past to present to future. And then I propose that space is made up of matrix, matrices of time strings. I won't go into great detail, but I want to show how this basic structure form a theory of quantum gravity. I won't go into detail on this slide either, but the important point is that space, to show that space can flow through space, just like water, currents of water can flow through currents, th flow through an ocean, you can have a current within the ocean. So too, it's, I'm proposing that space can flow through space. And it is a flowing of space that causes gravity. Slightly different way of explaining gravity than general relativity, but I actually believe it's the same notion. I propose that fl uh, space flows into voids or something similar to a black hole inside particles of mass. Space-time will vanish inside of these particles. And this flow warps space-time as described by general relativity. So although I'm not a physicist, I've done some math and I have been able to demonstrate that this, these concepts are in accord with Newton's, general, uh, Newton's gravitational equations and Schwarzschild's radius equations. Uh, Schwarzschild's equations were simplified equations of Einstein's more, much more difficult equations of general relativity. So, and it also explains time dilation and gravitational fields. So to understand, uh, get back to what time dilation basically means, the uh, slowing down of time in fields of gravity. So we need to, to understand why that uh, happens. We look at how photons travel in space. And what I propose, that the speed of light is constant because photons move along a time string, which forms space, one Planck length per Planck moment, which is one existence particle per moment. That is, they move from one existence particle to the next existence particle in these time strings. And they will do that no matter how dense the space time is. So if you notice, right in the, uh, towards the, where that void is in the middle, space time is flowing and you can see that the density is quite great. The existence particles are quite close together, whereas further away in the less dense area, the existence particles are further apart. To travel the same amount of space um, distance, you know, the photon will have to traverse uh, more existence particles and so it will take longer and therefore that accounts for why time slows down. Okay, so that's, that was the uh, quantum theory in a in very brief, it has a lot more detail to it than what I am able to give in this overview. So now let's turn to human consciousness. Neuroscience is unable to explain how, how the brain generates consciousness. Now, whereas other mental phenomena such as seeing, hearing, and feeling have physical correlates. For example, we see light with our eyes, 
And we also observe and measure light with instruments, such as cameras. So we, there's a physical correlate for light, what we see. Likewise, we hear sound waves with our ears, which we can also measure by instruments, such as microphones. But there's no way to directly observe consciousness. In other words, there are no physical correlates. So something new must be added to physics in order to explain consciousness. And of course, my suggestion is existence. Now, although physics is unable to directly observe consciousness, in-depth systematic exploration of the mind through meditation can lead to a direct experience, although a subjective experience. And the ultimate experience of consciousness that has been spoken about throughout the times, particularly in Eastern religions, is referred to as nirvana or realization. Now, Mayor Baba describes nirvana as a state in which the universe ceases to exist for the, the one who is experiencing it, and only consciousness remains. In this state, consciousness is and nothing else is. This pure state of consciousness informs us as to the nature of consciousness, awareness of self. In my definition, I call it, I refer to, I define consciousness as awareness of self-existence. So in order to explain consciousness, we must explain self and we must explain existence. So it focuses on two areas in my framework. I focus on two areas. One is how does the self form in the human mind? And the other is what is the nature of existence? It is role in the universe, which the quantum theory that we just went through already has explained. And so it includes a cognitive model of the mind and the new physics, which has existence as being the fundamental aspect. So now what about the self? Well, the self must integrate all the mind's many independent processes. We know from uh, neuroscience that the brain has motor, olfactory, visual, and auditory, and other specialized areas working pretty independently. The self has to integrate these various aspects so that you and I have one unified, complete experience. Furthermore, each of the brain's systems have subsystems. subsystems. Thus, the brain is hierarchically structured. And here we have the visual system. We can see that V1 through V5 are the different aspects of the visual system. The sense of self includes all of these subsystems. In other words, the mind is hierarchically integrated. Information flows up from lower levels, from sensory input up to the higher levels, and then back down. And this cycle continually repeats. And there's also cross-communication between the various subsys subs subsystems, so it's a very complex structure. So I establish a bridge between this neuroscience science psychological model of the mind with Meher Baba's spiritual explanations of the mind, which is also hierarchical in nature and explains the formation of the sense of self as being the ego, the integrator of experience. The structure of the mind which Mayor Baba reveals is based upon seven higher levels of consciousness, and these higher levels operate unconsciously in normal human activity, but are experienced by those who have advanced higher spiritual states of consciousness. At lower levels of the hierarchy is normal human consciousness, and higher levels are attained through spiritual advancement. And during advancement, one's consciousness, consciousness transforms first from matter into energy, and then with greater advancement, transforms from energy into mental experiences. And the mental realm contains mental impressions, or in modern day terminology, I would refer to them as algorithms. These mental impressions are the impressions of experience, the memories of experiences. And these impressions become the algorithms which control energetic desires, which in turn activate physical actions. Information flows up the hierarchy from the senses, to the mental realm and then back down at, as the mental algorithms control desires and actions. So this is the brief uh, description of the cognitive model. So now the question is, how does this, this self defined by the cognitive model link with existence? So I propose that just as the eye can sense photons, the brain as an entire organ can sense existence particles. Neuroscience tends to look for portions of the brain responsible for consciousness. But I believe consciousness is a result of the entire brain, or maybe perhaps just the entire cortex's activity. The brain functions, functions as one whole integrated organ when all the various areas are integrated through the formation of the sense of self. Now, how might the formation of the sense of self lead to the perceiving of existence? Well, I think brainwaves might provide a clue. 
because they reveal levels of consciousness. For example, when, when asleep, unconscious, brain waves are very slow. When awake, they are faster. And when you're highly active, they are at the highest frequency. Now, higher frequency brain waves would indicate more interconnected neural activity. In other words, brain waves are fastest when the sense of self is at its greatest formation. I propose, and I don't know exactly how this would come about, but I propose that the very dense interconnected complex of networks within the human cortex create a unique electronic field of waves that is not found anywhere else in nature because of the intendous, tremendous interconnectivity of neurons in the cortex. It's something unique, not found anywhere else. And I propose that this highly integrated sense of self and its corresponding electro electronic energy field creates a void in which existence can emerge. And it's a void in space-time. And it's a void from which existence particles can emerge, just like they did at the moment of the Big Bang. So the self perceives the emerging existence particles, and the result is consciousness. Self becomes aware of existence. The self becomes aware of its own existence. So the human brain replicates the original contrast between infinite existence and infinite non-existence, which resulted in the creation of consciousness. All right, that's a quick look at the theory of consciousness. Now let's take a very quick look as to how this theory of consciousness can be used to form a theory of spiritual dynamics. Spiritual dynamics would be explaining spiritual advancement. As we have seen, the human brain recreates the universe's creation process. Existence emerges from a singularity, just like at the time of the Big Bang. And existence emerges, as we know, from originally from the transcendent infinite realm. So that ent entails that there implies that the brain's connection with infinite existence uh, is possible. And it's this connection with infinite existence, which is generating our, which is how we're getting or originating our consciousness, gives humans their spiritual nature. And it's interesting that Buddhism stresses the importance of connecting with the void, which is the void is, of course, what I'm proposing is where existence particles emerge. The void is like a black hole inside of space-time. And Meher Baba stresses the importance of realizing the nothingness of the universe, the non-existence of the universe. And it's through the void that our consciousness is generated, and it is through our consciousness that it's possible to know, see, and become one with infinite existence, or God. So this has been a very quick overview, and we can see that each of these theories uh, feed into the other theories. And I thank you for listening. And for those of you who are interested in knowing more, I can direct you to my website, richbloom.net. And there you can find articles, other presentations I've made, a link to my book, The Architecture of the Universe, as well as an email link if you wish to contact me. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Richard. Wonderful. Well, um, now we can come into our time of some questions and uh, maybe a little bit of uh, conversation and discussion on this. We have about uh, 10 minutes that we can do this uh, here in, in dialogue. So we've had some questions coming in. I'm going to start with those that we received thus far, okay, Richard? And then we'll see if there are any more. Uh, we will be, we have a team gathering the questions. So please go ahead and type your questions in the chat. We'll see how we're moving along with that. Maybe we get some audience participation direct as well. So what do we have here? One of the questions um, is... Uh, Coming to us from Violetta Bulk, uh, she's asking, okay, so look, even in the quantum physics, the, the principles of uh, that the role that the particles, the quanta play, there's always a relational dyna dynamic there. She says, how come you deny the role of an individual in the collective? Does not an individual co-create the collective? Isn't the magic in the equilibrium of the whole and individuality? One of the things I didn't speak about was how each individual mind creates its own universe. So we're all creating the universe. I think that's the best thing I can say <laughs> to answer that question is, uh, I didn't get to touch upon that, but that's an essential part of the cognitive model of the mind is that we are creating our own universes. Even though there's an objective universe <laughs> that we create, it's actually a, a subjective creation. I hope that answers the question. Okay, no, good, good, good. I'm just going to uh, go through these and, and let you respond exactly as you wish, of course. Okay. Uh, a few more then that have come up. Uh, 
there is a, uh, maybe just a comment for reflection, this uh, Gerard Artsen mentioned that it was interesting to him that the, in uh, 1888, Madame Blavatsky had postulated that the three aspects of the as absolute that are involved in creation are abstract space, movement, and duration. Do you see this in relation to your framework? The absolute, as I understand it, is something which is an infinite, unified, and at that point, the absolute has no differentiation. So at that point, there is no movement. There are no other things to move. There's no space or time yet existing in the very absolute reality. Space and so I believe space and time emerge from that infinite state. And that's what I'm trying to explain. Okay. Perfect. So now more questions are coming in, you see, as we start going here. So I'm going to move along with these agilely. And thank you again for making your, your responses uh, uh, to the point as well. Thanks. We can get more questions in that way. Uh, Sunil um, Malotra of Idea Farms, Idea Farms um, mentions that the central conception in Hindu philosophy is of the absolute. Now, we're just touching on that, so I want to bring that up. He said that this is the background of the universe, this absolute being according to, for example, Swami Vivekananda uh, in his 1894 lecture, is always in the feminine gender. So this absolute being, which we can predict nothing about. If you have any, because of course, you're a spiritual tradition as well, any comment on that? Uh, again, I think in the absolute reality, there be neither male nor female, as those would be, that this absolute reality is beyond any sort of differentiation. But it doesn't mean in our relationship to it, we might not relate to it as a female or we might not relate to it as a male, but I actually think it's all encompassing and would include both all male and female aspects. Excellent. No, thank you. Thank you, Richard. You know, this, this actually had brought up a question for me that I'd like to just pop in here. And this is about your existence principle. You're saying existence is fundamental. I always love to ask um, uh, people who are working on this, what is the quintessence of the cosmos? You know, is it consciousness, spirit, matter, vibration? Are, are these all aspects or um, superstructures of the fundamental underlying substructure of existence particle? Again, the absolute, I think, is devoid of any description, which makes it hard. Uh, the only thing I, I think you can say is that it exists. That's kind of where I'm, I'm coming from. I'm just asking from. about the, uh, the uh, not about the absolute anymore, but about the quintessence of the cosmos. The cosmos. Uh, is, it, is it fundamentally the existence particles that you're talking about? Or is it consciousness? Is there something, is it vibration? How would you put that? Yeah, so existence particles, as I propose, I said that they could also be like considered quantums of consciousness or quantums of information or even quantums of love because in this in initial most abstract state, there's no uh, differentiation of those at that at, yet at this point. And these different attributes begin to form through the evolution. So you could say the attraction between two existence particles is energetic. You could say it's, it's a form of love they have for one another. And so these different points that you mentioned all kind of begin to emerge as the universe gets built out and differentiated. But initially, they're all, they're all the same. There is no difference between love, consciousness, existence. OK. OK, good. And Rosemary McCullen asks along these lines, why do you prefer the word existence rather than being? Well, I don't know. <laughs> I, don't, I mean, it could be being. I, I think existence is, for me, just um, it implies non-being, non-existence. I mean, they're just two different words. I, Meher Baba tends to use existence, so I think I use existence. Well, that would explain it. <laughs> Very good, thank you. Okay, a few more questions, and then let's see how we're doing here. Yes, we still have uh, a bit of time here. We're heading up on our break, just so everyone knows, uh, but we are uh, still uh, have about another five minutes or so for some questions. So let me continue here. Please send, continue to send your questions in. There's a rather uh, in-depth question. Let's see how, how this works for you. Uh, Elena Maslova-Levin asks, how does, your, how does this framework connect or contrast with Nassim Haramein's unified theory? The truth is I'm not that familiar with it, so I can't say for sure. But I, from what little I know, I think we may have some parallels. 
Excellent. Very well, this is part of what the uh, what the symposium about is about is to make these connections, uh, yeah. as Urban said to begin with. So uh, wonderful. Thank you for the for the question, Elena. Let's see here. There is a question. If you have the uh, CD CD Clayton asks, do you have a word for what holds existence and non-existence as a duo? I guess the question also is, do you see them as a duo? This existence, non-existence frame. Well, again, it it, it could be love. <laughs> that binds them together in, in terms of moments of time when they bond together. There is an essential uh, impulse in everything to regain that original state of unity of oneness that the transcendent infinite reality is. And so existence particles bond together because they are trying to get back to that original state of unity. And I propose that the entire evolution of the universe as things become more and more complex is that continuing uh, attempt to regain unity. And so as complexity builds up, it's, it's they're trying to become, un, you know, they build a union with more and more things. So uh, our brains are highly interconnected. It's a, a very uh, attempting to get, regain unity. The self is an attempt to regain unity. And we all have an impulse to regain that original state. So um, that's the thing that's that existence and non-existence is trying to, bridge it back into that one original state in which there is no differentiation. There's only, right. it's only oneness. Right, so, so it really is not a non-dual, non-dualistic framework that you're holding here uh, ultimately. Yeah. yeah, 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 very interesting. Good, I think we'll hear more about that from other speakers as well as we go through the two days here. Um, Victorio, Victoria, sorry, uh, Martino asks, how do you define love? Are you using the term love to express the absolute? And uh, is not the absolute in and of itself ineffable? Yes, it is. <laughs> and love, well, I mean, I'll say this, that uh, Meher Baba emphasizes love. And love is the pathway to experience this transcendent reality. It doesn't give a lot of importance to cosmology, although he has created it. So in my own life and practice, uh, love for the transcendent reality, love for humanity is as best as I can do it, is extremely important. And so, uh, and it is something that is in the universe from the very beginning. As I say, the attractions of two, two particles, distance particles, is a sense love to, to merge back together. Yep, excellent, thank you, thank you. Gerard Artsen says, oh, I already asked from him, but let me ask this as I mentioned here, he says, uh, could we say that what you call existence is actually a sea of consciousness from which involves itself which evolves itself into denser projections of itself before evolving to the point of individual or human consciousness. I, I would say that the universe starts from a point of unconsciousness and evolves to consciousness. So there are limits, limit, each, each thing in the universe has a degree of consciousness, but it's a very limited amount of consciousness, whether it's an existence particle or a photon of light, an electron, they all have their own experience. They have a form. They have laws that they operate by. And so they have some degree of consciousness, but there's something unique about human consciousness. And it's that uniqueness that enables us to then have consciousness of the higher spiritual states and eventually to experience consciously the original state of infinite existence. Well, you know, uh, this is wonderful. Thank you for this. And I think uh, this is great for everyone who's listening also to kind of take uh, a moment to think about these, obviously, these, these connections with consciousness and the what is primary, what is the quintessence, if you will, the, the fundamental essential characteristic of our cosmos, right? Uh, is it vibration? Is it consciousness? Is it existence? What emerges from what? Right, and what is th this is what we are considering in uh, in part at this part of our symposium. Just to wrap up here, I want to give one last comment to you from Jai, who says, "Hi, Rich. How does your view relate to the idea in God Speaks? How the past is present to us as if we were really the present." I have to think about that. <laughs> I don't have an answer. Yeah. Um, no, every, every, kind of in a sense, every everything happens in the moment. I, I know that in the moments, the only thing, but. You, you, you kind of have to have a, a pretty advanced view if that's how you live in the world. I, I, so for the most, you know, in the, for the most part, 
in the universe, most things have a past, present, and future. But everything happens in the moment at the same time. That uh, we, you know, we cannot we can only experience the past in as, as terms of memory. We cannot experience the future. So everything everything of our own experience happens in the moment. And so that I can I can say. Yes. Agree. I mean, this is where, you know, cosmology, philosophy, uh, and uh, spirituality, and uh, all are coming into our explorations of these new, new paradigm uh, science, and they all feed them. So fantastic. Uh, Damien says, great work, Rich. It was helpful how you laid out the breadth of the various theories of existence and how they interact. For example, the quantum and the spiritual. And th that's it. I think uh, I'm just going to ask everyone if you can come back in 10 minutes. We're going to be meeting in the follow-up. Keep formulating your questions as we think through this biggest questions of cosmology. Thank you very much. We'll be back in 10. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Alexander. Welcome back. We're now going to hear from our second speaker. His name is Frederico Fagin, and he's going to speak on the nature of consciousness. Very happy to have Federico here. Federico is a physicist, engineer, inventor, entrepreneur, and author. He developed the Moss Silicon Gate technology at Fairchild in 1968, and he designed the world's first microprocessor at Intel in 1971. So if you ever get angry at your computer or your phone, you can only have Federico to blame because he is the inventor of the microprocessor, which is in all of our devices. Federico also founded and led Zilogs, Synaptics, and other, other high-tech companies before starting the Federico and Elivia Feijin Foundation, dedicated to the science of consciousness. His autobiography, Silicon, from the invention of the microprocessor to the new science of consciousness, is available in the United States on Amazon. So with that, Federico, I'm happy to have you here, and I turn it over to you. Thank you, Richard. It's a pleasure to be here and to talk about my views about uh, consciousness and the cosmology that ensues if we believe that consciousness is fundamental as opposed to an epiphenomenon or the functioning of the brain, which is what science is telling us. So what is a physicist doing with consciousness? Uh, I think that probably a few minutes of my background would, would help orient you as to my view point and the reasons, the motivations, why I have been dedicating my life to the study of consciousness for the last 12 years and study it with personal work for 20 years before that. As a physicist, educated University of Padua in Italy, came to the, U to the US in 1968. Background, it was a, obviously, in terms of values, was, came from Catholic religion, which I grew up with. I then slowly but surely moved away from any sort of religious kind of cosmology to the cosmology of physics. That seemed to work. It seems to explain all kinds of things. Uh, not everything, but uh, little by little, I became a physicalist, like uh, most scientists are. So then, clearly, if we need to explain consciousness, the only way that you can do so as a physicalist is if you say that consciousness is epiphenomenal, because consciousness is must be a state of the brain, and therefore, consciousness, which is what we feel about the state of the brain, has no causal power. In fact, that we cannot move objects with our thoughts. Obviously, consciousness, consciousness is a phenomenon that accompanies a more important phenomenon, which is the state of the brain, which is what has causal power. And the same is true for free will, because most scientists believe that free will is also a epiphenomenon. phenomenon. In other words, they believe that free will does not exist. And certainly, if the world worked as classical physics is saying, 
in other words, through deterministic equations, then clearly free will could not exist because everything could be predicted from those deterministic equations as far as the future is concerned and by changing the sign of time as far as the, back go the, the past goes. In 1986, I started a company called Synaptics, uh, the company that invented the touchpad, the touch screens that you use every day. In that company though, early on, I wanted to develop the electronics, the, 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 uh, the technology for neural networks, which of course now are the devices, are the, the, uh, the structures, the algorithms that are, have solved the uh, artificial intelligence problems. So I study neuroscience, I study biology, I'm a physicist, so I, did, I knew little about that. And at one point I asked myself, but these this books of neuroscience, they are all telling me that there are electrical signals, bio, biochemical signals, signals in the brain, you know, as if my conscious experience was identical to those electrical signals or those biochemical signals. What's wrong with this picture? I actually have feelings, I have sensations. I, I don't see electrical signals. And being a physicalist, and knowing that consciousness was explained between quotes by saying that is, a, that is a property that emerges from the brain, this epiphenomenon that I was alluding earlier, then of course a complex system should be conscious. Therefore a computer should be conscious. And so I, I was curious, I wanted to find out how can I make a conscious computer just uh, you know, out of personal curiosity thinking about how could I program, because that's how computers work, you make a program. How can I program a computer to make it conscious? And the more I thought, the more impossible that task appeared. There is no way to convert electrical signals into feelings. We don't even know what feelings are. And I was really baffled about that, uh, strongly baffled about that. And that was combined with a moment in time I was going through a middle age crisis. I was uh, about 50 at that time. And, uh, and I was asking myself, uh, you know, what, 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 what am I living for? I mean, I, I, I was unhappy. I didn't know why I was unhappy, but after having reached, achieved everything that the world says that you should be happy if you achieve those goals, like being rich, that you, that you don't have to work anymore, being, famous and having a great family and everything working for me, why was I, I have unhappy? And it was in that, in that, that milieu of intellectual curiosity about consciousness and deep unhappiness that for the first time I was able to acknowledge to myself that I had an extraordinary experience of consciousness. It was uh, uh, completely spontaneous. There is not a time to say it, but that experience basically allowed me to experience myself as the observer of the world. And the observer of the world was a point of view of the world itself. It was observing itself. In other words, I was the world observing itself and the feelings was of an incredible love. A love so powerful that I had never felt such love before. Moreover, it was impossible, I thought, for me to generate that love. So I was generating the love that I was experiencing. There was me and that was the universe. So that really, gave me an unbelievable look at what reality might be because the sense that that was much much truer than what normal reality is was so strong that i could not forget about it i could not just uh, say okay well that's just uh, you know i had a glass of wine too too many so that could not be dismissed at all so that kind of experience was so powerful and so compelling that in fact it changed my life. 
I had many other experiences after that, but the point is that that was the breaking from a physicalist point of view to a new point of view that however begged for explanation. I, I wanted to understand what's going on here. How can I explain this experience? It is so real that it must be explained just like a physicist explains how two balls that bounce against each other work. I'm a physicist and therefore I wanted to understand how love and meaning would be part of science. And that was the beginning of the journey that lasted 20 years in order for me to develop the kind of sense of the dimensions of consciousness so that I could experience them because experience is private. You, you cannot know what I experienced and I cannot know what you experienced. So it's being private as an experience, it cannot be measured. So here we have something that is different than what physics believes reality is. We have something that cannot be measured. So how does it work? Through many experiences, I had, for example, I could see that consciousness could reduce itself to a point. And that point had everything that I was included in that point. And that point was at the base of my sternum, for example. So that's another experiential finding. In other words, this is not a thought. It is an experience. And for example, the difference between thought and experience, thought as an intellectual activity and experience as something that you live, something that is, you know, has dimensions that are not in a thought, was at that point for me was, was not so clear. I mean, you know, we, we have our ordinary experiences. We, we are conscious, we live our life, but we, we don't really know what's, uh, we cannot discriminate the subtleties and the subtleties begin, begun to reveal themselves in 20 years of work where I develop understanding, where my consciousness, for example, at one point was everywhere. It was in the grass, in the home, the, the houses that I was seeing. I, I, you know, like if my consciousness was way beyond the boundaries of my body and, and things of that sort. My point is that I'm trying to understand and bring science and spirituality together from a viewpoint of an experiencer because that's the only point that we can take. Uh, because if we start from an intellectual point of view, we're never going to get there because the model of reality that we have as physicists is a model of reality, is a mathematical model of reality. But how can mathematics be reality? In fact, there are many physicists today that, that claim that reality is mathematics. How is that possible? How can existence uh, in the sense of lived experience, not just the existence as a word, lived experience, be a piece of mathematics? That doesn't make any sense to me. Certainly not as an experiencer. My model started with this overarching set of experiences where I came to the understanding that physics alone cannot explain all this stuff. You know, physics alone, it can explain information. Information is classical in information, the information of, of uh, our computers, channel information, which is an information without any connection with meaning. The other type of information, which is incomprehensible, which is quantum information. And quantum information relies on quantum bits. A quantum bit is a kind of very crazy thing because fundamentally corresponds, it corresponds, it isn't that, it corresponds to an orientation in space of a vector. Any point on a sphere, on the surface of a sphere would represent a value or a state of that quantum bit. When that quantum bit manifests in physical reality in space time, that quantum bit will manifest only as a bit. In other words, as a zero or a one. Clearly, we're talking about 
quantumness being a reality that is far, far vaster than physical reality. The one that we think that is in space and time, the one that we deal in our normal lives. So consciousness must be a property of that vaster reality. And then quantum information must be a correlate of experience somehow, where the classical information is a correlate of actual symbolic, the symbolic aspect of reality. So all of a sudden, I thought we have some kind of understanding of some basic stuff here. Physics, both in the form of quantum physics, uh, quantum field theory being the most, uh, uh, the most uh, advanced form of quantum physics, and general relativity are both holistic in the sense that, for example, in, in, in a general relativity, mass affects space and time and matter, and, 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 and any other one of these, uh, of these aspects are interconnected. So you cannot talk about, you cannot separate these variables. You cannot separate space from time, from matter, from energy. They all interact together. And that's a move away from reductionism where space, time, matter, and energy are separate things. So already in general relativity, you see that reality is made of part holes, not of parts that can be taken apart, like our machines. The same is for quantum physics. The particles of classical physics were bounded, were, <laughs> you know, they were you know, eternal, uh, limited, uh, uh, bouncing against each other particles that would create everything else. But then quantum physics found that uh, no, that, you know, th those particles are not, are not like, like that. Even if we could explain a lot, if we assume the existence of those particles. Particles in quantum field theory are states of fields. The field is the entity and the particles don't even exist as objects, they exist as states of the field. So if you start with this other way of looking at reality, then the least thing that you can say is that the totality of what exists, which are called one, must be holistic, must not be made of parts that are separable. Everything about one is connected with everything else. The principles then starts with having one, and one, of course, uh, must have a principle that provides the foundation for a theory, a model that makes sense. And the principle that I chose was that one desires to know itself. In other words, what moves, what creates is the desire of one the totality of what exists to know itself. Of course, I don't claim that to be the first to think about this because, uh, you know, in a temple in Delphi, there is, you know, know thyself as a fundamental principle uh, uh, of human beings. But here I'm extending this principle to one. One wants to know itself. How can one know itself? That's where consciousness comes in. To know itself, one must have portions of itself which are, which are not conscious and portion of itself that are conscious. The ones that become conscious, they are the ones that one knows itself. So that makes sense. So there has to be potential existence within one. That's what uh, uh, Richard probably refers to non-existence, but non-existence is, a, you know, is in incoherent. It is potential existence, something which is not conscious. So consciousness is what allows to go from potential existence to existence. In which way does it exist? By being conscious of it, by knowing what, you, what exists. So consciousness in this view is absolutely fundamental and it cannot be defined with anything less than itself. So consciousness is what allows one to know itself 
bringing from the infinite potentiality of what one is something into his consciousness. When that happens, because one, because one is it, you know, is holistic, right? When that happens, it, it, I, I say a consciousness unit is born, a unit of consciousness, an entity that has consciousness, that has free will, that has all the characteristics of one, that has the potential to know itself exactly like one has the potential to know itself. And so all of a sudden we have a, we, we, we have a beginning, which of course it cannot be a beginning in time because there is no time yet. I mean, I'm talking about the, the before the, you know, the, the, the explanation of how the universe has been put together. So, so I'm talking about in, in terms of, you know, in terms of a, of a fantasy for now, but if this fantasy then can begin to explain things, all of a sudden we had the beginning of a interpretation of reality that brings, con that brings meaning and purpose to the universe, which physics doesn't have. The consciousness units, by the way, are very close in terms of concept to the monads of Leibniz. As you remember, Leibniz was a contemporary of Newton, and he, he did not agree that the universe that was explained through Newton's three laws of mechanics uh, could be explained simply as a mechanism. He felt that you know something was left out consciousness, free will, I, I, I don't think that he was so, he didn't use necessarily these words, but what was left out was exactly the meaning and purpose of the universe. And physics has done very well without meaning and purpose, but now as we are beginning to create machines that are able to appear to have consciousness and many claim that they will have consciousness, we are beginning to ask ourselves, what the hell? I mean, are we that? Are we those machines? Is it really all we are? This is to me the core issue that needs to, to which we start with a theory. Now, there is a theory, the beginning of a theory of consciousness, which uh, I have developed together with a, you know, one of the authorities in the, in the world in quantum information. Uh, Giacomo Mauro Dariano is a professor of physics at the University of, uh, of Pavia, in fact, is the the head of the theoretical group there, the theoretical physics group, and, and it, it will be published shortly. And, uh, and basically in this, uh, in this model, entities, conscious entities ex are essentially, they can be described by this model, but they are, not, they are more than what the model describes because the description of reality is not reality. Consciousness, is a property that a quantum system is in a pure state. A pure state in a quantum system is a state that cannot be obtained by the combination of other states. Those are things that do not exist in classical physics, for example. Quantum systems, which is in a pure state, has the experience of its own state, which is exactly what I started with. So the experience of its own state is a property of special quantum systems that are, would be equivalent to the CUs, the conscious units that I mentioned earlier. So if you start that way, all of a sudden, you have the beginning of a theory that also explains why consciousness is private, cannot be measured. Why? Because quantum information, which would be the state of the system, the pure state of the system, cannot be copied, cannot be known or the best that you can know is a, quant is a classical bit per quantum bit. And those quantum bits are actually entangled. Entanglement is a property of quantum physics that is unique to quantum physics. In fact, it's the property that distinguishes quantum systems from classical systems. That's why computers can never be conscious because they are made of bits and bits can be copied. So if you, if you were, if, if consciousness was a property of a computer, you can, you can make copies of yourself. <laughs> and there would be a thousand yourselves identical, you know, in, inside a thousand different computers. So this is impossible because it violates one of the fundamental properties of consciousness, which, which is that your experience is private. I wish I had 
another hour, but I don't. So I stop here and I'm sure I will have stimulated enough questions for the next five minutes or 10 minutes that I have for the question. Thank you. Thank you, Frederico. Let's see what questions come in. But before we do that, let me, we, the last thing you were saying is that a computer cannot be conscious because you can make copies of a computer and consciousness is pr something that's private, if I understood yeah. correctly. Yes. Okay. So what, is there something you, whoops, sorry. Is there something unique about humans that enable us to be conscious and, and the computer not conscious? So in, in this theory, only quantum systems in a pure state are conscious. Now, the evolution of the pure state would be the outer representation, this, this, you know, the, this, let's say the symbolic representation, uh, because it's mathematics, of an, an, an evolving inner experience. So in this model, consciousness, which is the capacity to have an experience, is foundational. You cannot, you cannot, de you cannot say consciousness derived from something else. In your model, existence is the foundation, but existence, existence, you know, is hard to put properties on existence. Uh, but but consciousness is really, in this case, very precise. Is the property of quantum systems which are in a pure state? I mean, then you can test this. You cannot you cannot say, well, you know, well, well, well. if you have it, if you can show that it. If a system, a quantum system, which is not in a pure state, is conscious, well, then uh, the theory that we have is falsified, which is great. You know, then we then we figure out a better way to doing it. <laughs> okay, uh, let's see. Here's a question from um, Alexander. He says, "You distinguish, or at least contrast, thought and experience. Would you make a similar distinction between consciousness and sentience? Which is primary, consciousness or sentience, as an aspect of the cosmos?" Excuse me, I didn't get it. Conscious or sentience, uh, S C N T I E N C E. Or, or sentiment. Well, the, the, the no, sentiment. sorry, sorry. Uh, consciousness or sentience. Sentience. Oh, 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 this is the same. Sentient is being conscious. I mean, so so is this is the same thing. A sentient being is a conscious being. Uh, I mean, sentience uh, in in the general term, you know, in the general understanding of that word requires consciousness. But this, this uh, theory that, that I just, you know, just mentioned, uh, unfortunately, there is no time to go because it's, it's too complex to, to explain in a, in a short period of time. It just is impossible. And so, so, uh, so uh, this theory basically is a is panpsychistic theory. In other words, uh, it, you know, uh, th there may be, you know, uh, the fields of which, uh, the, the fields of quantum physics are conscious, you know, it just, you know, as the field that, that are in a pure state, you know, they're conscious. And, uh, and the particles themselves are really the symbolic expression of conscious being. So, 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 so the particles cannot be seen as foundational. What is foundational is the conscious experience, which is a field. The conscious experience, which is, which is you know, which we say, in quantum physics is, is a quantum system, but the quantum system in physics is a field. Consciousness is, is, is a fundamental property in, in, that in my opinion, uh, uh, you know, the space and time that we think is physical is in fact a creation of consciousness. So, so you know, the all uh, the, the old structure of the universe with the way physics is, is you know, describing may have to be revisited in terms of consciousness being fundamental. In fact, it may, it has to be revisited because all of us, you know, because creation of the universe in this model becomes the creation of a, a co-creation of a number of conscious units that, in, that interact, that communicate with each other. So, so the foundation of reality is a co-creation of entities which are part holes. In other words, they, are, they, are, they cannot be part because they are not separable from one. So they are part holes of one. One knows itself through the CUs, through the monads that it creates. So that's, you know, that's a, another fundamental point uh, to, you know, to this theory, which, which I haven't 
described as much. <laughs> Okay, another question is, uh, what is the ultimate purpose of consciousness? Exactly the same purpose of one, to know itself. A conscious unit is, a, is an entity that is a part all of one that has three characteristics. It's conscious, in other words, it can experience itself, can know itself. Two, it has agency, and this agency means it can act in the world, and acting in this world with free will. But acting in this world means communicating, means creating symbols. The third is identity. The identity is that that conscious unit knows itself within itself. And it knows the difference between itself and another self, even though it perceives another self like itself. But it knows the difference. That's exactly like we do, when, especially if we are in love, we think of the other self as us, but, but it's also not us. So there is this sort of almost apparent contradiction that, that exists in quantum physics. Uh, uh, you know, something which is a particle and a wave, you know, something like that. There is, there is, there is a logic which is not the Boolean logic of this uh, space-time mm -hmm. and uh, in, in space-time. So, so the, the, this is the, you know, this is another piece of the, you know, of this model. Another question is, uh, do you differentiate thought from consciousness? Thought is one of the ways in which we ex consciousness experiences itself. So, it, and there, there are basically there are there are there are, there are four. The fundamental, you know, as in, as, as embodied consciousnesses that we are, there is the physical sensations. The physical sensations are, you know, the feeling, you know, the 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 uh, vision, the, you know, all the five senses, and also the the inner senses about the body itself, not the inner senses that, that, that go beyond physical. Uh, then the emotions. So the emotions, you know, they go from love to uh, to to hate to to uh, you know to curiosity to what have you. So emotions. The thoughts. Thoughts are also feelings. If you if you think about a thought, you know, typically when we think, we think already verbally in our mind. That is already a translation of a thought. The thought is the one that happens before you translate the thought into a sequence of words. And so th those are, you know, that, you know, only if you do meditation or so on, you quiet your mind, you will be able to get in touch with the essence of a thought, which is like an image. It's, it's something that, you know, passes through your mind. You can even learn to have the thought itself without being verbalized at all, just pass through your mind and you see it, you understand it consciously without symbol, symbols, without translation, without reification. So that's fundamental. It's a fundamental aspect of, of consciousness. And then spiritual, the spiritual feelings, which are the, the feelings of, 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 you know, the sense, the feelings of unity, you know, you are the world that observes itself. You are, you know, you, 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 not, you, you, you're part of a, of a cosmos of which that you cannot be separated from. So, so spirituality, when you have those feelings, generally the other three aspects of yourself enter in resonance with that. Or perhaps you can even say that when they resonate, then you have this, you know, this, uh, this uh, feelings of expansion and, and unity. So you could say that there are three that could be independent, but when they enter into resonance, then you have one overarching feeling, which is this, uh, you know, this uh, spiritual, spiritual feelings. Frederico, thank you very much. Very enlightening. We got many comments from people how much they enjoyed it. Very much appreciate your sharing it with us today. Thank you. So I'll, I'll see you tomorrow at the last session. Yes, the panel discussion at the end. Yes. All right. Well, thank you. Our next speaker is Jude Currivan, and Jude is a cosmologist planetary healer, a futurist, an author, and co-founder of The Whole World View. She was previously one of the most senior businesswomen in the United Kingdom as a CFO and executive board member of two major international companies. She has a master's degree in physics from Oxford University, specializing in quantum physics and cosmology, and a doctorate in archaeology from the University of Reading researching ancient cosmologies. She has traveled to more than 80 countries, worked with wisdom keepers from many traditions, 
and had been a lifelong researcher into the scientific and experiential understanding of the nature of reality. She's the author of six books, including the international bestseller and award-winning The Cosmic Hologram, and her next book, Gaia, her story will be published in 2022. She's also a member of the Evolutionary Leader Circle. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Jude. Thank you, Richard. Hello, everyone. It's a joy to be with you, and I've been absolutely loving what has been shared so far. So I'll sort of take the talking stick and, and run with it perhaps a little further. So I'm going to share my screen, if I might. So in the time I have today, I'd like to share with you what I call a whole world hyphen view, cosmology of a conscious we've spoken about already, about conscious being fundamental to the new paradigm. And I continually, you know, I continue that perspective. But what do we mean and how does then cosmic mind, cosmic consciousness, sentience embody itself in, in a universe that doesn't just exist, but exists and evolves from simplicity to complexity? So what I'll share with you today is, is where my journey of direct experience since I was four years old and walking between worlds and hopefully following the evidence and the exploration of the nature of reality has, has brought me to this point, correlates quite nicely with what Federico said and to some degree also with Richard and I do believe this is all a work in progress I believe there's now a confluence a convergence of science and spirituality where we're all saying pretty much that conscious is fundamental as indeed Albert Einstein perceived as Max Planck did and, and I'd like to share in this particular presentation, perhaps a slightly different, but very much complementary perspective of what Richard and, and Frederica have already shared. How in this model does the appearance of our finite universe and, you know, what I've written about in the cosmic hologram is the evidence. Everything I share today is evidenced. And in the book, uh, I, I do a great deal of, of bringing the evidence together at all scales of existence across numerous fields of research. So what I'll share today, I don't have time to, to share the evidence, except in a couple of instances, but all I share today is well evidenced. It's very much based on the Einsteinian view that the universe is as simple as it can be, but no simple, but it is a conscious, sentient, living unified entity as sir james Jean said a great thought rather than a great thing in the infinite and eternal mind that einstein called cosmic mind that others have already called god so we've come a journey we've come a journey from newton who i always love as perhaps the last of the alchemists rather than just one of the first of the natural philosophers but a perspective of things but what newton did as as, as richard mentioned earlier he, he took what he experienced on earth and then he realized that that equivalence extended beyond the earth and and i love what richard shared about equivalence because when we look at the nature of equivalence it's our way show it's a way shower to deeper and ever more fundamental perspectives of the nature of reality. Again, in the 20th century, as, as, as Federica referred to, you know, and also Richard, came along these two paradigm, shift, paradigm shifting perspectives from that Newtonian viewpoint to a cosmology and the, of the very large, which was relativity physics, and the perspective of reality at the very small scales of quantum physics. But as we'll go on to share, those are completely interpenetrative. So we're not in the place of just perceiving quantum phenomena at the very small. We're not at the perspective of seeing the, the relativity at the very large. But all of them, to some degree or other, even with the clues that quantum physics gave us, with the clues that relativistic physics gave us interconnectivity, we still over the last nearly 100 years have put that perspective to one side. We've ignored the elephant in the room in mainstream science, which is the nature of consciousness and its fundamental uh, nature to the whole of reality. So we still lived in an old, to my mind, unsustainable and fundamentally misguided perspective of reality as being made up of things and of separate things. And that perspective of the illusion of separation has taken us to where we are now. And what we're now realizing, and Federico and Richard, and I'm sure the other speakers will refer to, we're waking up, 
to remember we're inseparable. We're all of us aspects of a universe that exists and evolves as a unified entity. Going back to what Frederico was talking about unity. For me, what's crucial is that new discoveries, and I could only have written the Cosmic Hologram 2017, really with, with discoveries over the prior few years to that, but what is really key for me is the evidence. We're now presented with ever more compelling evidence that what we're sharing is that the, we're on the right direction. But what this is doing is it's offering us an integral perspective to how our universe emerges from deeper realms of causation and intention and does so meaningfully. And so we're seeing that instead of mind being epiphenomenon, consciousness and epiphenomenon of a physical universe, that the appearance of the universe itself is an emergent phenomenon from deeper realms of consciousness and mind. And whilst it was ushered in by quantum relativistic physics, it's only now possible by understanding the role of information. And I really want to stress from the get-go that when I talk about information within the framework of a whole worldview, of a living, sentient, evolving universe, that I'm talking about not random data. I'm talking about meaningful in hyphen formation. But what we need to add to this framework is some work that's been done in understanding the reality of black holes and what they tell us about the nature of reality and information, which the so-called holographic principle extends to the entire universe. So what this perspective is revealing, and as I say, it's absolutely based on evidence, is the primacy of mind and consciousness articulated as digitized ones and zeros of meaningful in hyphen formation. And that articulation, when we think of an English language with 26 letters of the alphabet of themselves not embodying any meaning, when we combine them as words and sentences and poetry and songs, they embody meaning to us. What I'd like to share today is how this perspective shows that our universe does so by actually articulating the cosmic mind that is embodied in this great thought form we call our universe as such digitized universal alphabet of just two letters. As simple as it can be, but no simpler. But from those two digitized ones and zeros, just as in our technologies, we can, we can describe an image, a vision, a sound, a name, all that we choose to in terms of strings of ones and zeros that of themselves don't have meaning, but when the string is written, is encoded, is decoded, is translated, it offers us a communication of meaning. And this is represented through dynamic and literally relational patterns. Somebody was asking in the chat, what's love? For me, this is love. Love is the absolute foundation, the conscious foundation of our living and sentient universe, because love is the profound interconnectedness and ultimate unity of all that is. So already it's been noted that physical reality is extremely ephemeral. I mean, the universe is parsimonious. It doesn't use any more energy matter than it absolutely has to. And yet from that innate simplicity emerges and evolves this absolutely wonderful, radical diversity. But that ephemeralness, as Federica referred to, it's no dash thingness. It's the fields of relational information. That is, it, it, that is the stuff, that is the basic stuff of our universe. And I'll come back to this point of non-locality or, or, or entanglement later. But before I do, I just want to sort of ground what we're talking about, because the nature of information itself is we often think of information as non-physical. And maybe we need to, to restate what we mean by physical, because in 2012, an experiment by Antoine Barou and Eric Lutz and others showed that de they demonstrated that information of itself is physical because by deleting a digitized bit of it, 
releases heat. Just as when we rub our hands together, we generate heat. We look at that as energy matter, but as I'll go on to share, information is expressed in complementary ways as energy matter, and I'll show space time. But this, this was a breakthrough experiment because not only did it show that information is as physical as what we might call energy matter space time, but it was in line with theoretical predictions by Leo Zylard and Rolf Landauer and others. So we're beginning to have both discoveries and experiments that show this, as well as a theoretical framework that supports it. But the evidence is at all scales, from the Planck scale that Alexander mentioned earlier, which is the most fundamental measure of our universe. And the Planck scale is actually just shows five fundamental attributes of our universe. Energy, matter, space, time and temperature, just five. And I'll come back to why just five and how they all pull together to offer this framework in a moment. All of the evidence at all scales, from the Planck scale to the entire universe and across numerous fields of research are showing this. And that includes cosmology and physics and chemistry and meteorology and systems theory and shows that the same patterns pervade the entirety of our universe, whether they're human collective behaviours, ecosystems, or the way in which cities and galaxies form. And I'll come back again, this is meaningful information that literally informs the reality of our universe. In the last couple of years, and actually since the Cosmic Hologram was published, in 2017, a coalition of cosmologists found the signature of the Cosmic Hologram within the entirety of space, and what they discovered was that at an early epoch, about 380,000 years after the beginning of our universe, which I talk about not being in a big bang, which wasn't big and it wasn't a bang, it was minute as we know, but we imply with a bang it was chaotic and yet it was incredibly ordered and fine-tuned. The, the, the actual means by which cosmic mind co-creator created our universe to exist also embedded within it an innate evolutionary impulse but what we found is this informed and holographically manifested perspective of a universe because what we're seeing is within this cosmic microwave background we're seeing the signature of the holographic means by which cosmic mind literally projects reality into what we call our universe. So within space-time, the flow of time maintains universal causality, yet quantum mechanics only works if our universe is also in its entirety non-locally interconnected, entangled. And this too was proven in 2018 by entangling Photons of light in a laboratory, starlight from 600 light years away, and light from quasars, which is a very powerful active cause of ancient galaxies, the furthest of which was 12.2 billion light years away. In other words, the light from that quasar left there 12.2 billion years ago, and yet it correlated with starlight from only, only 600 light years away and photons of light within the laboratory itself. Now this is showing us what quantum mechanics needs to work that our entire universe is non-locally connected and ultimately unified. And what this does, it supports what a number of our researchers call supernormal phenomena, telepathy, remote viewing, remote cognition, intuition, near-death experiences, synchronicities, all the things that mainstream science have just no, had no ability to explain, this emergent cosmology of consciousness is able to do. Now, what it's now showing us is how it does so. And we need to, to put together 
only literally three laws, fundamental laws of, of physics or cosmology, which are three laws previously understood as being of thermodynamics, together with the holographic principle to show us that our universe exists and evolves as a unified, innately informed and holographically manifest entity as a great thought of cosmic mind. So by expanding and restating the three laws of thermodynamics into three laws of information, such infodynamics show us how. First of all, the first law talks about energy and matter. It talks about how the energy of a contained system is conserved through time. So in other words, within a contained system such as our universe, quantized energy and matter is universally conserved. But when we now realize, thanks to Beru and his co-experimenters uh, and Landauer and others, we understand now how information expressed as quantized energy matter is universally conserved through time. This enables our universe to exist, but it says nothing about how it evolves. That's why we need a second law of thermodynamics. And this second law talks about a concept called entropy. And again, in the second law of th thermodynamics, how a contained system, the entropy of a contained system increases through time. But Boltzmann, Ludwig Boltzmann, who came up with this concept of entropy way back in the middle 1800s, before even atoms existence had been confirmed, talked of entropy as the energetic microstates of such a system. But now quantum informational researchers are now expressing, instead of entropy, entropy as the informational content of a system. So for our universe, it began, we know, cosmologically in its lowest state of entropy. And ever since that moment, 13.8 billion years ago, the entropy of our universe has increased. As space has expanded and time has flowed, the informational content of our universe has increased. So the expansion of the holographic boundary of space and the flow of time literally continually adds informational content. Now, that of itself is a how-to. It's like a how-to manual algorithm of, of our universe. But because our universe embodies universal meaning, so its informational content is innately meaningful. It is in hyphen formational. So this second law of infodynamics shows how our universe goes beyond just existing to be able to evolve from simplicity to complexity. The reason there's a third law of infodynamics or a third law of thermodynamics expanded to infodynamics is that in a contained system, its temperature is inversely proportional to its entropy. So from the very beginning of our universe, which began at the highest possible temperature, the Planck temperature, 10 billion trillion trillion degrees above absolute zero, the highest temperature, the lowest entropy, as space expands and time flows, the temperature drops and the entropy increases. And that's what's been happening for the last 13.8 billion years. Now our informed, and holographic universe reveals itself through universal patterns and processes that not only pervade the so-called natural world, but throughout human systems and behaviors. And we're finding now this geometric relational informational signature of the cosmic hologram being discovered all scales from atoms to our planetary home, Mother Earth, Gaia, to our solar system, to vast galactic clusters, and as I mentioned earlier, the whole of space. This framework is revealing, I think all our frameworks are showing, is that we in our entire universe are relational in hyphen formation. We meaningfully inform and are informed by the great cosmic thought that is our universe. 
where mind and consciousness aren't something we have, but literally what we and the whole world are. But crucially, this isn't just a consciousness, a cosmology of consciousness. This is an evolutionary cosmology because it's also revealing evidentially that our universe, as I think it was Federica, but Richard was talking to this too, unity, oneness, choosing to learn about itself, to experience itself, to embody itself, to individuate within itself, creatures such as ourselves. But this is so much more as an evolutionary consciousness and, and an evolutionary cosmology about human consciousness. It's about a universe that itself exists and evolves as a unified, sentient, living entity. It exists to evolve. This is something I'm writing about, I've written about in my next book, Guy Her Story. And I've just fell in, fallen in love, <laughs> I've fallen in love ever beyond one wonder and awe with our universe that began in its simplest form, but it had the potentiality, it had everything it needed to evolve from simplicity to complexity. Incredibly fine-tuned, the simplest and, and, and most ordered, innately ordered first moment of a big breath. A primordial arm. Before it was transparent to light, it was transparent to sound. For the first 380,000 years, our universe sang itself. It sang itself into stars and galaxies. When stars began to form from the primordial hydrogen and helium, and the helium was crucial because some of that nucleosynthesis to build up to all 94 elements was so incredibly challenging for the universe itself that without that primordial helium in the mix, carbon couldn't have been synthesized. We would not be here. And it went on to interstellar clouds and ultimately to birthing planetary systems. Embodied from that very first moment was the potential for all of this to unfold with our sun, our moon and Gaia, our planetary home as a triple system, each needing the other to co-evolve and for Gaia to nurture her biological life forms. Our entire solar system exists and evolves as a resonant, harmonic whole. Gaia's a water planet. Without it, we could not be here. She embodies all the elements of the entire universe. She is in a co-creative evolutionary partnership. Not just her biosphere, her, biology, her biological organisms, her biological children, such as us, but her geosphere, her hydrosphere, her waters, her atmosphere, all all co-create together in coherence, in super coherence, as a whole organism, a whole sentient, living, evolving being. And biological emerges, each successive holarchy of informed complexity embodies new properties, phenomena, behaviors, organs are more complex than cells, they're more holarchically complex than cells, bodies are more holarchically complex, Ecosystems, a more holarchically complex entire Gaia sphere is. And stress challenge drives evolution, a progressive evolutionary impulse and an ongoing collaboration of competition, healthy competition, but also cooperation. We're even more than stardust. The hydrogen in our bodies is as old as the universe. Our DNA in every single cell when we stretch it out, it's two meters long. Each of our bodies, I can see George on the screen and Richard and Alexander, when we take the entire DNA in each of our bodies, it stretches across the diameter of our entire solar system. For the entirety of humanity, our entire DNA when rolled out would stretch 10 times the visible diameter of our galaxy. We embody distributed, not just our minds. There's a wonderful um, documentary called The Blob, Intelligence Without a Brain. Slime molds don't have a brain. They don't even, even have a nervous system, but they're intelligent. Non-local intelligence, distributed intelligence 
is the nature of our reality of our universe. And we, in this perspective, are microcosmic co-creators of our universe, embodying its evolutionary impulse. We're its evolutionary, co-evolutionary partners and co-evolutionary partners with Gaia. It's a great and finite thought within the infinity and eternal cosmic mind of unity, of wholeness. It's differentiated as a great thought, never separate. We are differentiated of its unity and diversity, but we're inseparable. It exists to evolve and everything in existence has meaning and purpose. And we're its microcosmic co-creators. So what do we now choose to co-create together? And just to finish, Gaia, her story is by perceiving and experience our entire universe and planetary home as a living, sentient, and embodying innate meaning and evolutionary impulse. Gaia, her story will offer a deeply ecological, hopeful, and emergent perspective in these times of our choice. And it converges with ancient and indigenous wisdom teachings. How the ultimate oneness gives rise to an exploration of its own beingness in the doingness of the great thoughts that we call universes. And Gaia, her story invites us to remember that we're all Gaians. So I'll stop there. Thank you, Jude. Wonderful and inspiring. We have just a few minutes for questions. We have a lot of questions. I'll just start with one here from uh, Gerard Artson. He asks, isn't consciousness that engenders the information from which our reality emerges? Yes, in the sense that it's, it's, a, it's a dance of wholeness. That consciousness, if we say cosmic mind, cosmic consciousness, you know, I describe in Gaia her story, our universe as universe soul, to sort of give it that deeper sense of, you know, of, of innate consciousness, innate sentience. So how that consciousness expresses itself with this sort of framework, this whole worldview framework as a cosmic hologram is as pixelated at the Planck scale, digitized in formation with that universal alphabet of ones and zeros, but absolutely combined as meaningful and quantized energy matter, which is conserved throughout the whole cycle, but in tropic space time, so that as space expands and time flows. That's how our universe and its consciousness informationally explores and experiences and individuates itself within its wholeness so that we can be here today having this exploration. <laughs> but this consciousness is, is in this perspective innate to the entire, the entire universe. Not just humans. This is this is the entireness of our of our, our universal. Wonderful. Here's another question from Victoria Martino. What is love? Ever since I was a little girl, Victoria, I've walked between worlds and experienced our universe and the cosmos as innately benign and a loving being. So for me, love is about transcending the illusion of separation. For me, love is, is the wholeness of all that is. It's, the, it's, if you like, it's the glue, it's the substance, it's all of it. Um, and fear is when we forget that, when we fall into the illusion of separation, which can be of itself, feel very lonely. So for me, it's about a journey from that perceived loneliness of perceived separation to a sense of individuated aloneness to a homecoming of all oneness. And that's a journey into love. Uh, another short question for Mercedes Perota is, what is mind? Mind, I, I, I have a very good friend called Max, Professor Max Velmans, who wrote a book uh, called, it's a seminal book on the nature of mind and consciousness. And what Max discusses is that mind is the, the, the ground of all being, cosmic mind. When Mind, and I think Richard, talk, you talked about this earlier, and I think Federico did too, when mind 
articulates itself or begins to know itself, then it becomes, it reflects on itself. And that is sentience and that is self-awareness. So Max, and, and I would agree with this, suggests that what we term consciousness is when mind embodies a, a sense of self-awareness. All right, we're getting comments, wonderful and inspiring. The next book seems wonderful. So let's see, one last question here. I don't know how to pronounce it, but I'll just ask the question because I, I don't want to butcher her name. Is Does Gaia have seven chakra energy spots? That's a great question because part of my own work of, of, of exploration has been um, as, as a, to, to be with the consciousness of Gaia and her sentience. And there are a number of, of planetary healers who describe that sentience in, in, in terms of chakras. Personally, I, I'm not that prescriptive because I think you can get to be very specific and prescriptive about that. But what I would say is that my own journey um, took me um, 10, 20 years ago now into an inner and outer journey of discovery where I perceived that this was a time of a shift of human consciousness and a potential shift of Gaia's awareness and consciousness too. And that journey involved expanding beyond the perspective of the seven chakras to what is often called the Christed consciousness of a 12 into 13 unity consciousness. So I talk about the opening and the activation of the eighth chakra of the universal heart as part of our own expansion of consciousness and our then ability to commune with, learn from, um, and serve Gaia and all her children in this potential for conscious evolution. Wow, fascinating. Thank you, Jude. Thank you, Richard. Yeah, it's wonderful been... presentation. Good to see you again. Good to see so you. We're going to take a break for a little less than half an hour. We'll be back at two o'clock. Our next speaker will be Deepak Chopra. And we look forward to all of you coming back. We are back. Uh, and uh, this is Alexander Laszlo. I am going to be uh, sharing with you a little bit now as we do the uh, shift into our second part of the day, just a special treat that we have, a special treat. There has been some conversation in the, in the chat about what kind of music are we having in the background, and well, we have something very special for you right now, uh, and that is some live music. It is truly a gift for us to be able to have with us Chloe Goodchild, and she is going to share with us the gift of her voice. And again, this is really a, 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 quite a gift. She has done this before with us, uh, and it is always uh, so enriching because it, it's, it's not something that we have uh, planned for, but uh, we are delighted to be able to have her with us now. Let me give you just a little bit of background. Uh, Chloe Goodchild uh, is the uh, singing philosopher. She's a singing philosopher and vocalist and teacher, author, and founder of The Naked Voice. Uh, this is a pioneering vocal training program that provides sound awareness, a sound awareness toolkit of conscious core principles, practices, sorry, conscious core practices, music, audiobooks, and spoken meditations that empower people to be able to find and embody their authentic voice. But right now, uh, I want to uh, uh, just finish this by mentioning that uh, Chloe Goodchild also has a seminal book called The Naked Voice transform your life through the power of sound that was published in 2015. So without further ado, thank you so much, Chloe, for being with us. Thank you. Can you hear me all right? Great. Yes. What a blessing. It was just such a joy to be uh, just in, a, in this listening field with you all. And uh, it's, uh, it's a great joy just simply to share with you uh, a ways in which we might just deepen our own listening uh, with this within this extraordinary, very rich company of uh, individuals and explorers of uh, cosmology uh, as an act of love. Uh, and so, I'd love to share with you uh, an anthem that has been with me for many, many, many years. Very much inspired by the Rumi poem, "The Field," and. Uh, the words are simply out beyond ideas of right and wrong doing. There is a field, a singing field, 
I'll meet you there. So first of all, just if you'd like to take a deep breath and just take that, take in that long 380,000 years of Om that Jude was referring to. Um. And again. just to be aware of this extraordinary field that is just ever expanding that you have manifested we've all manifested between us at these passionate evolutionary times unprecedented times so enjoy thank you deep gratitude deep gratitude Thank you, Chloe. That was beautiful. Such a nice way to start the second session. Put us right into the zone. Thank you. <laughs> 